to the Talent Optimization Podcast, the go-to podcast for CEOs and HR professionals wanting to bridge the gap between the strategy and tactical implementation of talent optimization within their organizations. Through interviews, predictive index, and personal experience, your host, Tracy Shirk, helps you discover the facets of talent optimization from both a CEO and HR perspective to truly create the dream team for your organization. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to Talent Optimization. So today we are going to chat a little bit about the relationships that we have at work and how we use those relationships to impact and to motivate and cultivate our staff. So with us today, I have Jason Lauritsen, and Jason is a keynote speaker. And funny story about Jason, Jason and I actually met at a Wisconsin Sherm conference, I don't know, five, six years ago. And my question to Jason was, hey, Jason, I'm in a job that I love the job, but I don't love the culture and this person that I'm working for is just, uh, how do I get motivated? So I'm going to kind of, you know, hand this off to Jason now and say, Jason, welcome to the show. And I can't wait to dig into this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And I do, I remember that conversation and we were just kind of resetting on that as we were warming up here. You know, I, I get a lot of people for whatever reason, I think maybe it's because of being in HR in the past or because of my career path or whatever. I get a lot of people ask me questions like that. And I know that my response tends to be not what they're expecting, right? They're expecting some kind of magic, amazing advice that will help them like get their manager to pull their head out of the sand and suddenly become a better manager. And most often, and I think maybe this was the gist of the conversation you and I had my advice is often like, go find a different manager to work for. Like life is too short to work for people that don't get it. And there's plenty of people that do get it. So go find somebody that does and and life will get a lot better. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that I learned in that moment and kind of as we went forward is guess what? Every single one of us is created absolutely perfectly the way we are, but we're not created perfectly for every job and we're not created perfectly for every single environment. You know, so as we talk today about those leaders that we're working with, what are some of those key things that are important to them about really cultivating their staff in that relationship? Yeah, that's a big question. And I think you really hit the heart of it, which is, you know, helping people understand, like, you know, we have to go back. I, you know, one of the things, I realized for years and years, I, so I spent a decade in corporate HR. I have spent you know, a lot of time consulting and writing and, and railing against broken work processes. That's kind of been a theme for a lot of my career has been, how do we unsuck work? And that was because my early work experiences were terrible. I worked for terrible bosses. I had terrible, just overall terrible experiences. And I knew that it this can't be right. There has to be something better than this. And so I set out on this sort of crusade or was called to this work to try to fix things. And that led me into a like 10 years in corporate HR where I tried to fix it from the inside from one organization. And then today I, I spend most of my time on the outside trying to help managers and organizations fix it. But at the heart of this is a what I'll call sort of a paradigm issue or a mindset issue. And I've been talking a lot about this lately because once I realized this or recognized this, it was a big deal. And that is that the model of management that we still, that we're running today, modern management, is based on this sort of core idea that works a contract with employees, that we pay employees we sort of exchange money for output. So work is a contract and people are a sort of a, a means of production of work output. And so when you think about those two things, and I know that sounds very non-romantic, non-humanistic, non-HR-ish, but when you think about all of the processes and programs we have internally, the way we manage, you think about performance appraisals and job descriptions and all these other things that we do to people, it's really oriented around making sure that you know, we're getting our money's worth out of these people and that they're doing what we're paying them to do. And when performance is off, we try to fix the person, this broken person. We try to fix them. We try to make them. It's like fixing a piece of machinery. And what I came to realize is that the word you used was the right one. Cultivating is exactly the right word. And I realized that I grew up in small town, Iowa, 
in a farm. I grew up actually outside of a small town in Iowa on a farm surrounded by farmers. And in this, I mean, it hit me much later in life, even having grown up, but that farmers are in the business of management. They manage the growth and performance of living things, but they do things so fundamentally differently. Like they know, they assume that they know these seeds they put in the ground, these crops they plant are genetically hardwired to grow. They have everything they need to grow and manifest into the, the best, most maximized version of itself as long as it gets what it needs to grow and no obstacles come in like insects or whatever to sort of interfere with growth. So the, the farmer's job is just to facilitate and enable that growth to create an environment where it can maximize. And that's the job of management. That's the model we need. And so really the paradigm shift is from this production mindset that management has been operating on for a hundred years and shifting over to what I call a cultivation mindset where we do exactly what you talked about. You realize that people have everything they need. If we put them in the right situation, give them what they need, they're going to perform. And if they're not, it's not their fault. It is our fault. Absolutely. And one of the things you don't see farmers do is go out in the field, pick the seed up, shake it off, make sure it's growing and ask it 7,000 questions, then try to pack it back into the dirt again. That's right. (laughs) Right? That's right. And And they're not standing on the edge of the field, yelling at those (laughs) plants to grow faster or grow differently or giving them pep talks even. Like they're trying to motivate them externally. It's like, no, they're going to grow. That's their default setting. Their coding is growth and performance. Just get out of the way, make sure they have what they need, clear out the obstacles when they show up protect them so that they can do what they were born to do. And you'd be amazed by what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things farmers do really well is they know exactly what seeds are going to grow really well in that climate. And they know what is specifically needed. So, you know, most of our listeners are familiar with predictive index. And that's really what we're doing when we look at the job assessment is we're saying, hey, what type of environment and what type of kind of behavioral traits do individuals need to grow? And then we're matching the people to that job assessment so that they can grow. And then we get out of the way. That's right. That's right. It's And I mean, PI is a perfect example of that because it's a great point that farmers, they know a lot about the individual plants that they're working with, right? They know the biology, they know the science, they know the optimal growing conditions, they know when is ideal to plant, they know what kind of soil needs they have, what kind of whatever. And that's really what PI does that for us in a lot of ways, right? It helps us match the right seed to the right soil type, right? If we're going to stay with that analogy to put the right people in the right job. But then it also helps us as managers and leaders think about understanding their particular needs. I mean, I was talking with someone this morning about this whole transition that we're living through in terms of the evolution to the new, the new normal of work, whatever that means, the new world of work. And she is someone who desperately craves being in person with people. Like she desperately wants to be in the office because she gets so much energy off of in-person interaction. And yet, you know, we're now increasingly living in a world where in-person interaction is being highly undervalued. And so we're having a lot, you know, a lot of just, it's a very different world. And so if you don't recognize that this person needs that and find a way to get that for her, even if she's in a remote setting or a distributed work environment, if you can't fill that bucket, she's always going to underperform. She's always going to be disappointed. And so it is really about understanding not only the overall matching to the right place, but then really making sure you understand their needs and can deliver to those individual needs of each individual once they're in the role as they're growing and performing. Absolutely. And I'm just going to go back to our farmer analogy again, because I think it's a great one, right? There's times where the environment doesn't necessarily provide what's needed. We're in the middle of a drought or whatever else, right? But yet we're going to put the sprinklers out to ensure that they get enough water. And, you know, when we know specifically what our employees need, and that's what I love about the behavioral assessments, because it will specifically tell us, here's what your employee needs. Are you doing it? And let's reflect on it, right? You know, that we can really look at that and say, okay, now we know what we need, but we also know 
what we need to stop doing because just because we may need that as a manager doesn't necessarily mean that our employees need that. Absolutely right. So I will sort of the cool kids say double click on that because I think <laughs> I think we need to expand into that. So there's a piece of this that's around we go so wrong so often. And again, I mean, the same person this morning was telling me how she's engaged in this thing with her boss where they're, you know, they're going back and forth and her boss thinks like working from home in perpetuity is the greatest thing ever. And she's like, uh, no, it is not the greatest thing ever, you know, like, but it's because her boss is projecting her needs or assumptions on everyone else, which is something that gets in our way. So yes. But the other thing that if we take it then a step further is the difference in the farming analogy. And I think why we have to extend it to the idea of cultivation more broadly is that, and you think about plants and fields, right? It's a much more simple equation, right? It's a handful of needs and essentially all of the factors are out in the open. They're known and you can see them and they're sort of, whereas with human beings, it's a lot more complicated because it's like, you know, we only get to see into a little part of their lives and we get to see sort of how performance is manifesting in that part of their lives. And so even when we have things like PI and some of those tools, that tells us part of the story that tells Mm -hmm. part of the story about what we need to do when they're clocked into work. But the beauty of humans that's different than plants or, you know, that kind of living is that we can talk to them. We can monitor, we can have these conversations about what's going on and what their needs are. And I think, honestly, this is why, you know, I'm really bullish about what we've seen happen around well-being, Mm -hmm. about how, you know, we had well-being sort of wrapped in this corporate wellness program packet and tucked away in the corner. And we'd bring it out once in a while to peek at it to make ourselves feel like we were doing something nice and then we'd put it away again. And well-being got thrust into the forefront because suddenly it became really evident that like the stuff that happens in all parts of our lives, the stuff that happens, you know, that's happening to us individually, how we feel, how well or unwell we are as human beings in our entirety of our life has an enormous impact on how much of my capability, talent, resources I can offer to you as my employer. And so if you don't go upstream and cultivate and try to think about my needs as a human being in relationship or health or financial or spiritual or whatever that looks like, you're going to pay the consequences. And so I think it's a great thing that we've brought well-being to the forefront. And I think well-being actually is probably the model for management going forward. At least that's one of the things that, that... I'm advocating for is that sort of well-being moves out ahead of everything, even ahead of performance, I think, in terms of if we want to maximize performance, we've got to be serious about well-being of the whole human. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of well-being is also just the knowing, right? I know one of the things we were kind of joking about as we were getting warmed up was one of the things that COVID has brought forward is I've been serenaded with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. I know cats' names. I know the dog that's sleeping in the corner. You know, I know all those things that are happening with my clients and employees that I never knew before. Because guess what? Life is happening 24-7 and not just those eight hours that we're working. Because, you know, we bring a whole person to work. And when we know what's going on and are curious about that to where that individual is comfortable, we can then help to navigate some of that well-being. And some of it's, you know, within the work and some of it's not, right? So some of it's within our talent pathways inside of our organization. And some of it is just knowing what's happening so that we can be aware of it and also adapt as well. So I guess, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's even farther than that. I would say that resetting back to the production versus cultivation mindset and model of management. You know, in the production model that we ran, HR got sort of sucked in to be an unwitting accomplice to this whole okay. this whole setup of production. And so we had things like you don't bring your personal life to work, you don't become friends or become too close to the people that you supervise or that you work with. 
you know, all of this stuff, work related became a sort of, I'm doing air quotes with my fingers, work related, what's work related, what's not, you leave your baggage at the door. All of this stuff is built around the idea that like, no, you're just a means of production employee. I don't need all of that nonsense. Just come in here, do the stuff and then go home. And I don't want to know about the rest of that. The problem is that now we've come to realize not only do we want to know but I think we need to be more aware and actively involved in supporting the well-being of people beyond those work hours. Cultivation sort of helps us recognize. I've been talking a lot about well-being lately, and I keep using, you know, I have a lot of examples I, fall, I, I go back to, but I think we all know this at a personal fundamental level. So I remember in my early 20s, I did a, you know, I participated in a starter marriage. I'm kind of a slow learner on things. And so that was my warm up marriage. And I remember when it was falling apart, it was very young, it was falling apart. And I was a hot mess. Like I could not, I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't think. I didn't care about anything other than what was going on there. And there's a lot more to the story I'm not going to share with you today. It's not that kind of podcast, but. I was distracted. So I took days off from work because I knew I couldn't do anything. Right. You know, we all know what it feels like to try to work when we're sick. I mean, when I was a work hard, play hard guy early in my career too. And so I had a lot of days I do work, I'd go out with my friends to the bar and then I'd show up hungover the next day. And when you're hungover, you don't do your best work. When you're trying to educate your kids at home at the same time, you don't do your best work. When your right. marriage relationship is strained or you're caregiving, you can't do your best work because like half of your resources are being pulled to other things, your energy, your attention. You're just trying to survive half the time. And so when I show up to work, when I clock into my PC, when I get on that Zoom meeting or I show up to the hospital, whatever it is, 50% of what I have to give or 60% or 70% is already gone. It's already spoken for. It's already depleted. So no matter how great your talent optimization program is, if I'm showing up with only 40% to offer, 30% to offer, you can optimize all you want, but you're never going to get more than 30 to 40% unless you help me resolve my well-being. Right. So I think organizations can't, it's not just about even knowing. We have to get really comfortable having conversations. But if an employee is struggling with whatever it is, you know, some something to do with their kid or their marriage is struggling or they've got some other health issues or whatever, like we should not only want to know, but really be actively involved in wanting to support them because it ultimately comes back to a performance issue for us. And right. so they're not whole and well and thriving. They can't ever give us their best. Right. Absolutely. And I think that this is where we get into the conversation as to how do we do it, right? Because mm -hmm. I know we've had so many conversations about, hey, we know that these things are going on. We know that there's cycles of life. And as those cycles of life are happening, how do we make it okay that individuals can have these conversations and yet at the same time be able to handle the thing and have some grace with handling the thing and then also know I don't have to worry about the specific job that's happening right now. And yet there is a performance aspect of it. So how do we do an and both? I'm really curious about yeah. kind of your take on that. That's the question. And we've convinced ourselves that, again, and this is actually, it's generally in defense of the production model that we've built. We've convinced ourselves you can't do both, right? Don't get too close because if you get too close, you get soft and then you stop worrying about production or you stop worrying about performance. And I don't buy that at all because I've seen it happen both. And so there's two or three things off the top of my head that I would say are really important in terms of we can only get so deep. But number one, if you're an HR leader or you're an organizational leader, the first thing you have to do is you have to give people permission to care. We have to have an explicit conversation and give people explicit permission. As managers, it's okay to care. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay. If your people need to talk to you about stuff, like their relationships falling apart, like people will say, well, I'm not a counselor. I'm not their counselor. This isn't about being a counselor. It's about being a decent human being, about caring. It's like thinking like, what would I do if this was my best friend? If this was someone I was really close to and they were having this going on, how would I support them? Like be that person. So give them permission to care, number one. Because half the time, if you just demonstrate care, ask a few questions and listen and let them just talk, 
that alone goes a long ways. Knowing somebody cares, will actually listen and wants to help can go a long ways towards someone feeling like there's hope, feeling like they can do something, that sort of thing. So that's number one. Number two, once you give people permission to care, give them a basic structure and expectation around how to check in with their people. Really mm-hmm. basic stuff. And check-ins are different than one-on-one conversations. One-on-one conversations should be happening regularly too, but those are more focused on performance. Check-ins are checking in on the humans. And there's mm-hmm. a lot of different ways to do this. How are you? In fact, I, I have a cheat sheet on how to check in at my website. We can put the information in the the show notes. They can go check it out, but it's just a downloadable basic thing. How do you check in? But it's, you check in with the human. How are you? How's your head? How's your heart? How's your health? There's lots of different ways to do it, but you ask a question and it's not about performance. It's not about how you're coming on that project. It's not about any of that. It's how are you and finding out and just listening and asking follow-up to know how they are. So that's the second thing. The third thing where it connects to performance and this is something that seems so obvious, but we do so poorly, is we have to get crystal clear on expectations. That's where 90% of performance failures can be tracked back to a lack of clarity about what is expected. And it's not just what is expected in terms of, I expect you to produce you know, 1,500 widgets during this cycle, or I expect you to accomplish these things. But there's also clarity about how sort of this is how we go about doing, this is how we work. And that can be behavioral expectations. It can be expectations and sort of work quality, whatever that is. The golden rule of management that I preach is if it matters, write it down. So get crystal clear. If it matters to performance or how you're going to think about measure performance, you write it down. Because when people know what's expected of them, they know that you care about them and you're checking in on them in terms of the human part of it. They know like that you know you're checking in and you'll help them when things with the stuff that really matters to get them feeling more well and more thriving in their life generally. Guess what? They'll go make happen the stuff that you've decided to make happen. You don't have to do a lot about that and when they get stuck they'll come ask you for help because you now they now trust you and they know you care about them. Three simple things, do those three things and the rest of the stuff will get a lot easier. Absolutely, because that's developing that emotional loyalty, right? For sure. We have that that's back and forth. It's built on trust. We've got a great relationship that's built there. And then from there, the manager then knows, hey, I can trust them to get that thing done that I don't have to spend my time there either. I can go over and do this other thing. Thank you so much for those three steps and really clarifying that. You know, so as we kind of start to close, what I love about those three steps is it's crystal clear. And we have two different kind of listeners in our podcast. And so I'm going to have you maybe rephrase this a bit from our whole conversation, but what's one key actionable takeaway for our HR listeners? Actionable, I would say probably the most powerful thing you could do is create a script, templated script for managers for how to have a check-in with their people. And built into that is where you give them permission to have the conversation, you clarify that it's really about checking in on the people, you let them know this is not about performance, do not ask about performance, this isn't about a, you know, an update meeting, it's about checking in on the person, understanding where they're at, and then offering, asking, how can I help? That's it. If you were to create that, create it and get it out to your people, to your managers, give them permission to do it and give them a way to do it, you'll be amazed by how much of an impact that'll have. And bonus points are for you modeling it and showing that it's okay to do it. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. And and then what's that takeaway for our CEOs and our executive listeners? I think that's what you just said actually is money for the executives. I think it's more important for the executives to practice what they preach, right? To Mm -hmm. walk the talk when it comes to well-being. You need to model well-being. You need to model what it looks like to care for people. The executives at the top of the organization often are the people whose well-being and performance are are most overlooked because we just assume that they're fully cooked and they're capable and they don't need to be cared for. And I know I know they're struggling from conversations I'm having with them because of the burden they're carrying as well. So mm-hmm. as executives, as a CEO, care for your people, show them what it looks like, you know, ask them, do the check-in with them. 
prioritize their well-being, get crystal clear on what you expect of them, because through that, then they understand what that looks like, and then they can cascade that down to their people. And so it really starts with you. Make it, you know, show them what it looks like and feels like, and, and then stand back and watch. Absolutely. That collaboration is a huge piece of this being successful. So thank you so much for sharing with us today, Jason. And where can our listeners find you? Easiest place is my website, just jasonlortzen.com. You can, I'm sure, you know, look that up. If you can spell my name, which you can find in the show notes or description, punch my name into Google. You'll find lots of ways to find me. My email is jason at jasonlortzen.com. If you want to reach out directly, I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Thanks so much. And be sure to join us within our Talent Optimization Foundation program as well, where we do have our webinars twice a month that really dig a bit deeper into each of these topics. So thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Talent Optimization Podcast. You'll find more tools and resources for CEOs and HR professionals looking to bridge the strategies versus implementation gap of talent optimization at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. We've also created a free, valuable resource for you to begin bridging the gap called the Talent Optimization Foundation Membership Program. You can access it for free at elevatedtalentconsulting.com forward slash foundation. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode to learn more about talent optimization and creating a dream team for your organization.